Hi, I'm Pastor Brett, and I want to thank you for watching Guerrilla Christianity on YouTube. Uh, this channel is completely self-funded, and we never ask for donations. We don't do sponsorships. There's one thing that you can do to help us get more viewers, though, and that is to like, comment, and share. And also subscribe to our channel so that you can know when more new content comes up. We put up new content all the time. I want to thank you again for watching. Be blessed. And I want to invite you to take out your Bibles, either the ones that you brought with you or the ones in the pews, and turn them with me to the book of 1 John, chapter 5, is where we're going to be today. If you're following along in the pew, Bibles found on page 243 of the New Testament. We are continuing in our series called Agape, the Love of God. In John's epistle, we see how the love of God is experienced and expressed in each of us as his children. We have seen how we are drawn together in the body of Christ and adopted as children of God. Today, we look at how this love is the assurance that we have been born of God and put to rest any doubts that we may have whether or not we have been born again. Let us hear the word of the Lord for us now. First John chapter five and beginning at verse one. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And this, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. So today we're going to be looking at what it means to be born again and how can we understand being born again as compared to being born the first time, the physical birth? Um, yesterday was my birthday. I celebrated 55 years on this planet. I was born May 4th, 1969. I remember it well. The sun was shining. I don't remember anything about my birth. I... And, 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 and if you do, I want to talk to you because I don't know anybody who remembers the day of their birth. What's interesting is that 20 days after I was born, in a sense, I was born again. And I say in a sense uh, because I'm not talking about born again as we understand it in the biblical sense. I'm talking about being adopted, okay? Now, <clears throat> I was born on May 4th, uh, to a 15-year-old girl named Katie Babbick, who was unable to take care of me, was unable to provide for me. And so she did the best that she could. She gave me up for adoption. And 20 days later, on May 24th, I was adopted by the Walkers. Now, I was born... I'm giving this away. 
I was born George Babbock. Okay, George, we have a, a share a name, so. I was born George Babbock, but on May 24th, I was born again, in a way, as Brett Walker, as Robert Brett Walker, actually. Uh, my dad's name is Robert. My mom, I, I don't know if you remember uh, James Garner in Maverick, um, but my mom had a thing for James Garner, so she called me, never mind, I'm getting too far into that, but... <laughs> But uh, I, was, I was born George Babbick, but I was reborn in a way when I was adopted as Brett Walker. And I was adopted into this family, and it was as if I had been born into that family. I am a child of the Walkers in every sense of the word, okay, except the biological sense. Uh, now, our rebirth in the spirit is very similar to that adoption. In fact, we call uh, our rebirth the spirit of adoption. The Bible calls it our adoption into the family of God. We are adopted as sons and daughters of God. We are born in the flesh. We are born again in the spirit. We are born spiritually blind. We are born again seeing the kingdom of God. And what am I talking about? So. In John chapter 3, we, we read about this encounter between Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, and Jesus. Now, Nicodemus came at night because he didn't want to be seen by the other Pharisees to be hobnobbing with Jesus. But when he came to Jesus, he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are from God because nobody can do the things that you do unless they had come from God. And so he was affirming that Jesus Christ was something special. But Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, unless a person is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. They cannot see it. Now, Nicodemus had uh, some confusion over that. He says, how, how can an old man be born Again, can I enter into my mother's womb and be, and be born again? No, that, that's not what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't talking about a physical birth. Jesus said that unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's two things he said there. First, he said he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he said you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God is spiritual. And Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So, we are born spiritually blind. I did not plan it out this way, I promise you. In fact, I didn't even realize it until this morning. But today we're singing two hymns, number 369 and number 98, both written by the same person. Her name was Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby, through negligence of a doctor, in very young age, lost her sight. Lost her sight. The doctor was negligent and caused her to lose her sight, and she never saw again. And yet she is the one who writes words, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. She may have been physically blind, but she was not spiritually blind because she could see the kingdom of heaven just as clearly as you and I. We're born spiritually blind. We are born again seeing the kingdom of God. Jesus said, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We are born spiritually blind. We can't even see it. And once we are reborn, all of a sudden, our eyes are open. Now, if, if, you, <coughs> if you're driving along and you see an accident and you see that it's lying there, I'm not trying to be morbid, but if you see lying there, there's a person who is dead, you don't walk up to that person and say, get up, get up, come on, what's wrong with you? Don't, what are you lying around for? Get up. And yet, we do this all the time with people when we're talking to them about 
spiritual things. Just believe. Just believe. Why won't you believe? I've been telling you, and I've been presenting my case, and I've been laying out my defense very logically, and you still don't believe. Why? You're, why are you refusing to believe? Because we are born spiritually blind. And until you are reborn, you can read this book to your heart's content, and it will never make any sense to you. In fact, I, I know a lot of people who say, you know, I don't understand this or I don't understand that. And I try to explain it to them. And they say, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, <laughs> there's nothing I can do about that. You know, uh, we've had funerals in this church. I've had more than I would care to admit. But I would never go up to the casket and say to the person, get up. Just get up. Nor would I go to somebody and say to them, just believe. Because it's not an act of our will. It's an act of God's regeneration in us. And we have less to do with, we have as much to do with our spiritual rebirth as we do our physical birth. How much did you, how much effort did you put into being born? You know, did you decide one day, you know, I think today I'm going to be conceived and I'm going to grow in my mother's belly for nine months, and I'm going to be born on Tuesday, uh, September 3rd. You know, I'm just making that up. You know, at five o'clock in the morning, because I like to keep my mom up, you know. <sighs> we don't make that decision. There, none, of, none of us had anything to do with the physical act of being born, and we have as much to do with our act of spiritual Rebirth, okay? And here's another thing to think about. I don't remember the day I was born. I don't remember the day I was born. I also, I'm going to admit right now, I don't remember the day that God regenerated me. I know that he did because I believe this. That's the evidence that I have been born again because I can see the kingdom of God. But I don't remember the day. I don't know when it was. I do remember the exact day when I knelt down at an altar and I repented of my sin and I, and I trusted in faith in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. I remember that day. It was October 5th, 2008. But I don't know that that's the day that I was spiritually reborn. Something happened in me before then to open my eyes so that I could see the kingdom of God, so that I could receive the gospel, and so that I could respond to the gospel by repentance and faith. You see, we can't respond in re repentance and faith until we know what there is. It's like, a, it's like a, a child in the womb going, you know, it sure is dark in here. Uh... Maybe I should come out of here and, and see what's out in the world. We don't even know what's in the world. We don't know. We hear muffled sounds. There might be some little bits of light creeping through the skin on our mother's bellies, but I know I'm being gross, right? But seriously, you know, we can't see the outside world until we are born and then our eyes are opened and we see with clarity. And increasing clarity, because in the very beginning, we can't see very much at all. And we certainly can't make any sense of what we're seeing, because we've never seen anything like it. And it's the same way when we are spiritually reborn. That these things don't make any sense to us in the beginning, but they, they, these, the, the truths of the Bible begin to dawn on us little by little. We are born... Spiritually blind, we are born again seeing the kingdom of God. We're born in the flesh. We're born again in the spirit. And then we are born dead in our trespasses. We are born alive in Christ, reborn. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes, and you were dead. And he's talking about the whole church in Ephesus. They were all pagans. They didn't believe in God until he brought them the gospel. And some of them believed. And they formed the church. They're in Ephesus. And he wrote a letter to them and he said, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this work, of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. 
among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now that's really bad news. And then he turns it around with two words. But God. And that is a huge hinge upon which all of this swings. But God. He says, we were dead in our trespasses. We were, we, we, we were following the course of the world. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. Not because we loved him, but because he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's the promise right there. That's what it means to be born again. We were dead in our trespasses, but God made us alive again in Jesus Christ. That is amazingly powerful. Now, modern day evangelists will talk about being born again as if it's something that you need to accomplish. And I think that's, that's a terrible thing to say to somebody. I, and and I, there, look, there are evangelists that I listen to, their podcasts, and one that I really appreciate, his name is uh, Todd Friel. He goes on to college campuses and he witnesses his faith. And I love listening to him because it gives me ideas of what to say when, when I'm faced with those same uh, obstacles and, and objections by unbelievers. But one thing that he says that I take issue with, and I, and, and, and I love him as a brother, but it, I don't, and he doesn't mean anything by it. But what he says is, do you remember that they, he'll say to somebody who's a Christian, have you been born again? And they'll say, uh, yes. Oh, do you remember when you were born again? Uh, no, I don't. Well, how do you know that you're born again? How can you possibly know that you're born again? That is such a momentous event in your life that you should remember it. Guess what? So is birth. I don't remember it. I'm sure my parents do. My, well, my mom does anyway. She was there. I was there too. I doubt the doctors even remember it. But here's the thing. It was, an, it was the most momentous occasion in my life up until that time because that was the day that I went from being wrapped up in a warm enclosure of my mother's body to living out in the world. That's huge, but I don't remember it. And I don't remember when I was born again. From the beginning and throughout the history of Christianity has been understood that God alone is the initiator and the worker of this great gift. We have as much to do with being born again as we have to do with being born at all. And, which is to say, not at all. It's a work in us that God alone accomplishes, and whether you remember that moment and that it happened or not is as inconsequential as whether you remember being born or not. The result and the reality are the same. If you can see the kingdom of God, if you know the reality of God's existence and of his son's death and resurrection on your behalf, for your sins, then you have been born again. Your eyes have been opened and you have been given new life in Jesus Christ through water and the Spirit. So, so far in John's epistle, we're already to chapter 5, which is the last chapter. We've looked at what it means to walk in darkness, what it means to walk in the light. We've heard the message of love, that we are to love one another, and that agape love is the mark of a Christian. Now John brings his message home by pointing out that we in the body of Christ have been born of God and that to love one another is to love those who have been born of God as well. All right, so verse one. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. We've been talking about what John wrote this letter for. There were people who were saying that Jesus was not the Christ, and he called this the spirit of Antichrist. You can see that in uh, chapter 4, verse 2. Hereby ye know 
the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in is it in the world. So there are many people even today who deny that Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Christ. They'll say, well, Jesus was a good man. He was a good teacher. He, 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 he was a lot like Buddha. He was a lot like Muhammad. No, he was nothing like them because they died and he died and rose again and lives today. So being born of God means overcoming the world. That's what we're seeing here in this first section, verses 1 through 6, uh, 1 through 5, sorry. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. If you love the Father, you love the children, okay? And what we believe about Jesus matters. It matters greatly. We, have to, we believe that he is the Christ. 1 John chapter 2 also says, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Now remember, Antichrist is not Antichrist with an a, a capital A. He's not talking about the Antichrist who's going to come at the end of all things. But he's talking about a spirit of Antichrist being against Christ being opposed to the divinity and the human nature of Christ. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the, the Son has the Father. Whosoever confesses the Son has the Father also. And if we truly love God, we truly love God's children. Who, who loves the begotten, or him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Jesus said to the uh, Sanhedrin, If God were your father, you would love me, for I come from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. They were persecuting him and he was saying, Look, if, if God were your father, then you would love me because I am the son, is what he was saying. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So assurance is in loving God and keeping his commandments. And he says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome. Keeping God's commandments, are, it's not difficult for the regenerate, for those who have been born again. We are still tempted. We still might even fall into sin, but we can turn away from those temptations. Those who are not regenerated, it's impossible. We, they, they can't turn away from temptation. They just give into it because there's no one to answer to in their minds. Verse four. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. So the world here in view is that of all humanity in the flesh that is opposed to God. And you see that there are a lot of people in the world who are opposed to God. Uh, even today, opposed to God. Uh, in what respect? Well, they, 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 they don't want to hear about God. They don't want to talk about God. They don't, you know, you want, they want you to live your life, do your thing. You can have your own religion, but don't talk about it. I, we don't want to hear about it. Um, we see a lot of uh, things happening in the world that are in opposition to God uh, and, and the things that God is, is, has called us to do and to be. Verse four, well, we're still in verse four. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So our faith is what we believe. Our faith is what we believe. Uh, faith is a gift of God. First and foremost, in Ephesians chapter two, we read that by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. And God gets the glory. In everything. Faith is a gift of God and it's a fruit of the Spirit of God. In uh, Galatians, I did that before. In Galatians, really? There it is. In Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 through 24, Paul writes, 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. So faith is a gift of God. It's a fruit of the Spirit of God that's living in us. It is a clear indication of our regeneration. And faith alone is our victory over the world. Who is he, verse 5, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth, that's faith, that Jesus is the Son of God. Without faith, we cannot overcome the world. We are dead in our trespasses and spiritually blind to the kingdom of God. So, being born of God means overcoming the world. Now we see, uh, beginning in verse 6, that being born of God means receiving the testimony of about the Son of God from the Spirit. Verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. So water is a symbol of the Spirit. The Spirit hovered over the waters of creation in Genesis. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit, like a dove, descended upon Jesus at his baptism. Matthew 3.16, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So there's a testimony there about who Jesus Christ is. And it's the spirit of God that testifies this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. Okay? So the Spirit, what John is saying here is that for mere humans, we are born of the flesh and we must be born again of the Spirit. But Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the flesh and Spirit at his birth. He didn't, endure, he didn't have to have a second birth because he was born in the spirit when he was born physically. However, there's another view here that hearkens to the death of Jesus on the cross. John, who wrote this letter, also records for us in his gospel that one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear and at once there came out blood and water. It's a clear indication that, his, that the body of Jesus was indeed dead there was a separation of fluids that happened in the body and so he was clearly dead when the spear pierced jesus side he records that water and blood flowed out jesus had truly died but three days later he rose again conquering death for us and raising us to newness of life now verse still in verse six it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. The spirit of God is truth because God cannot lie. If only men testified to the divinity of Christ, it would be meaningless. But it is the spirit of God who testifies that Jesus is the Christ. Now, verses 7 and 8. By the way, the, the lectionary stops right there at verse 6. We're going to go to verse 12 because next week we're going to finish up with verses 13 through 21. And finish up this letter. Uh, but we're going to go on to verses 7 and 8. Now, next week's lectionary reading starts at verse 9. So we skip over verses 7 and 8. But I find that these two verses are pretty foundational for us. So we're going to look at them here. Verse 7 and 8 says, For there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. So these verses are foundational in that they establish a witness to the testimony of Jesus Christ. The spirit testifies within us that Jesus Christ is truly God. The water and the blood in Jesus' crucifixion testify to our eyes that he is truly man. Fully man, fully God, and that is displayed uh, for us. Verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, 
The witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. There are many who testify that Jesus is the Son of God, but the testimony of God's Spirit is greater than all of them. These books that we have collected for us, 66 books that we call the Bible, are collected as inspired works, and there is something transcendent about the reading of these words. These words, more than any written by mere mortals, transform us and conform us to the kingdom of God. And so Paul writes in uh, his letter to the Romans, chapter 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Verse 10 says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So believing in the Son is assurance of our regeneration. Before we are regenerated, we cannot believe or receive the truth about Jesus that he is the Son of God. Verse 11 says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Being reborn is to be born into eternal life through the death and resurrection of Christ. And finally, verse 12, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not, hath not life. There is only one way to the Father. And that might be a striking statement to some. There is only one way to the Father and to eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ alone. It's not me saying it, okay? It's recorded for us in the Bible. I'm not the one who's saying it. The apostles say it, but they're saying it because they're echoing what Jesus said. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So to say that there's only one way is not, it's not, It's not wrong, it's not cruel to say that there's only one way. It's not arrogant, it's just speaking the truth. Jesus is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So, those who are born in the flesh have an awareness of the world and their place in it. This awareness grows over time. In the same way, those who are born again in the Spirit of God have an awareness of the kingdom of God, and that also grows over time. We are reborn as spiritual infants. We may not even truly realize the moment that we've been born again, but sitting here, believing in the Son of God is evidence. It is proof. It's a clear indication of your regeneration. And those who have been regenerated love the sons and daughters of God. We are spiritual siblings, born again into the family of God through the firstborn of the dead, even Jesus Christ, our brother. We have an advocate with the Father, one who is fully man and fully God, who intercedes on our behalf and assures us of our place in the kingdom. Today, We gather at the communion table to join with each other in the breaking of bread, in the spiritual and symbolic receiving of the flesh and blood of Christ through these simple elements of bread and wine. Christ is the one who draws us together in unity and in love. I invite you to come to the table as beloved children of God, born of God and bound together in agape love and in the spirit of God. Let us pray. Father God, we are your children and we gather on this Lord's day to worship you and to give you all glory, honor, and praise. You have given to us your own son, born in the flesh and born of water and blood. And your spirit testifies to us this day that Jesus is your son. We rejoice in the spirit that we have come to know that Jesus died for our sins and rose again. We celebrate the love that you have given us for you and for each other. 
and we hear the testimony of the Spirit and receive it in faith, knowing that Jesus is the Son of God and that we are reborn in Him to eternal life in your kingdom. As we gather at the communion table today, may our hearts be full and our spirits lifted to meet you with Christ and one another in the agape love that you have given to us through your Spirit. All this we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Brett, and I want to thank you for watching this video. Now, this channel is completely self-funded. There are no uh, sponsors, and I never ask for donations. So if you'd like to help uh, to get this content in front of more people, what you can do is to like, subscribe, and comment on the video. And also, if you think that there's someone else who might want to see this, go ahead and share it with them as well. I want to thank you for watching, and be blessed.